In the saying before us, I see enough to enable me to believe that its words embody the mind of Christ. If I could not say this, I should say, The Apostle has here put on record a saying of Christ. I have not yet been able to recognize the mind of Christ in it. Therefore I conclude that I cannot have understood it. For to understand what is true is to know it true. I have yet seen no words credibly reported as the words of Jesus, concerning which I dared to say, His mind is not therein, therefore the words are not his. The mind of man can receive any word only in proportion as it is the word of Christ, and in proportion as he is one with Christ. To him who does verily receive his word, it is a power, not of argument, but of life. The words of the Lord are not for the logic that deals with the words as if they were things, but for the spiritual logic that reasons from divine thought to divine thought dealing with spiritual facts. No thought, human or divine, can be conveyed from man to man save through the symbolism of the creation. The heavens and the earth are around us that it may be possible for us to speak of the unseen by the seen, for the outermost husk of creation has correspondence with the deepest things of the Creator. He is not a God that hideth himself, but a God who made that he might reveal. He is consistent and one throughout. There are things with which an enemy hath meddled, but there are more things with which no enemy could meddle, and by which we may speak of God. They may not have revealed him to us, but at least when he is revealed, they show themselves so much of his nature that we at once use them as spiritual tokens in the commerce of the spirit to help convey to other minds what we may have seen of the unseen belonging to this sort of mediation are the words of the lord i would now look into and the father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape and ye have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. If Jesus said these words, he meant more, not less, than lies on their surface. They cannot be mere assertion of what everybody knew, neither can their repetition of similar negations be tautological. They were not intended to inform the Jews of a fact they would not have dreamed of denying. Who among them would say he had ever heard God's voice or seen his shape? John himself says, No man hath seen God at any time. What is the tone of the passage? It is reproach. Then he reproaches them that they had not seen God, when no man hath seen God at any time, and Paul says no man can see him. Is there here any paradox? There cannot be the sophism, No man hath seen God. Ye are to blame that ye have not seen God. Therefore all men are to blame that they have not seen God. If we read, No man hath seen God, but some men ought to have seen him, we do not reap such hope for the race as will give the aspect of a revelation to the assurance that not one of those capable of seeing him has ever seen him. The one utterance is of John, the other of his master. If there is any contradiction between them, of course the words of John must be thrown out. But there can hardly be contradiction since he who says the one thing is recorder of the other as said by his master him to whom he belonged whose disciple he was whom he loved as never man loved man before the word see is used in one sense in the one statement and in another sense in the other in the one it means see with the eyes in the other with the soul the one statement is made of all men the other is made to certain of the Jews of Jerusalem concerning themselves. It is true that no man hath seen God, and true that some men ought to have seen him. 
No man hath seen him with his bodily eyes. These Jews ought to have seen him with their spiritual eyes. No man has ever seen God in any outward, visible, close-fitting form of his own. He is revealed in no heart save that of his Son. But multitudes of men have with their minds, or rather their heart's eye, seen more or less of God. And perhaps every man might have and ought to have seen something of him. We cannot follow God into his infinitesimal intensities of spiritual operation any more than into the atomic life, potencies that lie deep beyond the eye of the microscope. God may be working in the heart of a savage in a way that no wisdom of his wisest, humblest child can see or imagine that it sees. Many who have never beheld the face of God may yet have caught a glimpse of the hem of his garment. Many who have never seen his shape may yet have seen the vastness of his shadow. Thousands who have never felt the warmth of its folds have yet been startled by no face, only the sight of a sweepy garment, vast and white. Some have dreamed his hand laid upon them, who never knew themselves gathered to his bosom. The reproach in the words of the Lord is the reproach of men who ought to have had an experience they had not had. Let us look a little nearer at his words. Ye have not heard his voice at any time, might mean, ye have never listened to his voice, or ye have never obeyed his voice. But the following phrase, nor seen his shape, keeps us rather to the primary sense of the word here. The sound of his voice is unknown to you. You have never heard his voice so as to know it for his. You have not seen his shape. You do not know what he is like. Plainly, he implies, you ought to know his voice. You ought to know what he is like. You have not his word abiding in you. The word that is in you from the beginning, the word of God in your conscience, you have not kept with you. It is not dwelling in you. By yourselves accepted as the witness of Moses, the scripture in which you think you have eternal life does not abide with you, is not at home in you. It comes to you and goes from you. You hear, heed not, and forget. You do not dwell with it and brood upon it and obey it. It finds no acquaintance in you. You are not of its kind. You are not of those to whom the word of God comes. Their ears are ready to hear. They hunger after the word of the Father. On what does the Lord found this his accusation of them? What is the sign in them of their ignorance of God? For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. How so? the Jews might answer. Have we not asked from thee a sign from heaven, and hast thou not point-blank refused it? The argument of the Lord was indeed of small weight with, and of little use to, those to whom it most applied. For the more it applied, the more incapable were they of seeing that it did apply. But it would be of great force upon some who stood listening, their minds more or less open to the truth, and their hearts drawn to the man before them. His argument was this. If ye had ever heard the Father's voice, if ye had ever known his call, if ye had ever imagined him, or a God anything like him, if ye had cared for his will so that his word was at home in your hearts, you would have known me when you saw me, known that I must come from him, that I must be his messenger, and would have listened to me. The least acquaintance with God, such as any true heart must have, would have made you recognize that I came from the Father of whom you knew that something. You would have been capable of knowing me by the light of his word abiding in you, by the shape you had beheld however vaguely, by the likeness of my face and my voice to those of my Father. You would have seen my Father in me. 
you would have known me by the little you knew of him. The family feeling would have been awake in you, the holy instinct of the same spirit making you know your elder brother. That you do not know me now, as I stand here speaking to you, is that you do not know your own father, even my father. That throughout your lives you have refused to do his will, and so have not heard his voice. That you have shut your eyes from seeing him, and have thought of him only as a partisan of your ambitions. If you had loved my father, you would have known his son. And I think he might have said, If even you had loved your neighbor, you would have known me, neighbor to the deepest and best in you.